the Holy Spirit's ready to speak to us. And as we've gone through James, we've, we've learned how James has met uh, a group of people. He's come to this church, and he's, he's talked to them because they're, they're not necessarily, they're, they're, they're somewhat young in their faith, but yet they had some of the same challenges that we have in our churches. Uh, there was, we talked about temptation, various trials, sin that gets in the way. We talked about attitudes. We talked about our mouth. Uh, when we talked about our mouth, we didn't just talk about, um, well, we talked about a couple things, about the words that we use, how they can give life or they can bring death. But we also talked about the attitude behind the words. Uh, because I can tell you hello two different ways, and you'll catch a whole different meaning. I can say hello. I can say hello. Two different things. has a whole attitude behind that. And many times we communicate in greater ways, by, not by what we say, but by how we say or, or, or don't, our nonverbal communication. And, and he addressed that. We're going to end it this, this week just kind of wrapping a bow on it, so to speak. Um, and I want to talk to you about increasing our integrity. Inter I'm going to say it in just a minute. Increasing our integrity. Uh, he ends in chapter 5, and I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version. And, and then I'm going to go read it from the message. Because when, when you read the, the Bible, uh, my dad, my dad, are you, do you still do King James? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he still reads out of King James. I don't understand King James. And you know what? It's okay. Because that's how the Holy Spirit speaks to him. Um, me, I'm all over. I'm, I'm a New American, Message, ESV. I'm all over the place. Because I, it has to make sense. And, and so sometimes when I study and I, I, I read, I can read a verse and be like, what do, I, I don't get quite what he said. And so I found it very interesting as I was studying. I'm going to read to you from James chapter 5. And James is speaking to the church, and he says this. I'm going to read verses 9 through 12. James talks to them and says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. That's some pretty strong words right there. Uh, he's tying your grumbling to condemnation. That's a big deal. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Verse 10, my brethren, take the prophets who, who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or earth or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Now, you may remember that verse, and you may remember that, oh, yeah, I remember that part, that yet let your yes be yes and your no be no part. And, um, but what is it really saying? And I, So I had to, for me at least, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go over to the message and read it to you, because when I read that, I thought, I, I get it. I, I know what James is saying, but, but what is he saying? <laughs> you know, how do, I, how do I make sense of that? And so let me look, read it to you from James, the book of James, uh, from the message it makes a little more sense, kind of puts it in words I can understand. It says this, same thing that I just read. Friends, do not complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing around the corner. Take the old prophets and your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit, all the time while honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him in the end? That's because God cares, cares right down to the last detail. And since you know that he cares, let your language show it. Don't add words like, I swear to God, to your own words. Don't let that language show it. Don't add words, uh, hold on, I messed that up. Don't add words like, I swear to God, to your own words. Don't show your impatience by concocting oaths to hurry up God. Just say yes or no. Just say what is true. That way, your language can't be used against you. Uh, James puts it in the message translation in a way that I can understand. He's telling them, church, I've talked to you about how we're supposed to live life. Whether it be from the, the things that tempt us to the struggles that you go through, to the power of your words, to the motives of your heart, to the way to the, that we're to love God and we're supposed to love others. It all boils down to this. If nobody can count on you because you have no integrity, then you have nothing at all. You can say, you can have all the money 
to, to go on a trip, but until you pay the price to get that ticket to go on that trip, you're not going to go. And, and James is saying, I've given you all the information that you need. I've given you all the, the, I've downloaded to you all the information, what God has spoken to me. But the only thing that's going to make a difference is if you have a heart of integrity that's willing to do it. That's the challenge he gives to us. And so here's what I wanted to do this morning. In your bulletin, there's an outline if you'd like to follow along. Fairly quickly, I just want to give to you this, this understanding because James is talking to them about letting your yes be yes and your no be no. He's saying, in other words, say what you mean, mean what you say. But have you learned in, the, in this world, one of the things that we're lacking very much so is integrous people. Uh, and, and, and here's the other thing that we're lacking. A forgiving heart to those who lack integrity and are willing to become integrous. Hey, did that make sense? We judge somebody who makes a mistake and then we forever keep them in that place of judgment. Did you notice James said, uh, don't be judging people. I love how he said, um, uh, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you. See, nobody's born with such the, uh, perfection for integrity. It has to be worked on. It has to be developed. And uh, we don't let people learn from sometimes those mistakes. And I want to share with you, why is it, so what we do is this, we, we tend to lie, cover things up, make up stories, embellish, do things like that. Here's what I want to share with you today. Why do we lie? Why do we break promises? And then I'm just going to spend time talking about how can we increase our integrity, okay? So the question is, is why do we lie? James MacArthur is a preacher from the Grace Community Church in the California area, and he made this statement that I liked. Let me read it to you. He said, our society is built on the framework of lies leading one to wonder whether our social structure would survive if everyone was forced to speak the truth even for one day. Could you imagine that? One full day that everybody in the United States of America, let's just say, had to tell the truth. How, how much would that rock the United States of America or the world? It'd change everything, wouldn't it? Remember the movie Liar, Liar? I don't know if you've ever, I have not seen the movie, but it's a Jim Carrey movie where I, I had read kind of the explanation of the story about a man who lied about everything and one wish was given that he would tell the truth. And, and uh, it's a comedy movie. It's something that they, they spoof on, but he made this comment. He was frustrated because he was telling the truth and he couldn't lie about anything. And he said, no one can survive in the adult world if they have to stick to the truth. And I thought, that's the way the world views uh, society and culture. If you want to get by in this world, you need to lie. If you, if, if you want to get by in this world and, and, and kind of get an edge on this world, you have to learn to, to, to shave the truth a little bit and manipulate things. And James shows up and says, no, you don't. You need to develop an integrous heart. You need to work on building on the inside out, not worrying about everybody else. And sometimes that might even come as a cost. You know, when we were just uh, worshiping now, and I, I was just thinking about, you know, the message in that, integrity what, it's, what I'm basically going to tell you today is, is an integri integrity means doing what you say you will do. This is what it's going to boil down to, even if it's going to cost you something. You know, I remember, I remember working in, in Dallas uh, for the hotels. Uh, you guys, if you get to know me well enough, you know I am not a fixer-upper guy, right? When something breaks, I call people who know how to fix it. Now, there's some things I can do, some basic stuff. You know, sometimes I can... I know how to change the insides of a toilet, or I, I, can, I can mess around a little bit with electricity, but just a little bit, and uh, otherwise I call on somebody. But the job I had was at a hotel, and I was the night maintenance guy, which here we call them maintenance. Uh, in, the, in the south, they call them engineers. Doesn't that sound so much better? Yeah. So when I called back, my parents said, did you find a job? Be like, yes, I'm an engineer. And they're like, an engineer? How did you pull that off? I'm like, I don't know, you know. She took look, one look at me and said, engineer. It, it was, I was a glorified maintenance guy. I had batteries for remotes in one hand and a plunger in the other. So anytime somebody in the hotel, their toilet got clogged up, I was their man. Anytime your batteries went out, I was your man. You know, if you had a rat or a water bug, down in the south they have these big water bugs. And you get one of those in the room and you don't like that, you call me, I get rid of it. You know, they call them engineers. And, and I loved this job because I, I got to interact with people all the time. And uh, I remember I came back for Christmas the very first year, and I thought I had everything lined up to, to uh, have my shift covered, but I did not. And when I went back, I came here for Christmas, and it was the first time I ever preached. 
As a matter of fact, I was putting my coat on this morning. I said, man, I've had this coat a long time, haven't I? And she said, yeah. She goes, that's the coat you were wearing when you preached the first time. And the, remember, the reason we remember that is because it was a horrible Sunday for me. It was the first time I was going to preach to everybody. And I was sick. I got my coat caught in the front door. And it, the door was locked. And I was at my parents' house, so I had to stand there and wait for my dad to come and lock the door so I could get out. And he looked at me, and I remember he looked me in the eyes, and he said, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. I was not okay. I was sitting on the front row, hands in the air, eyes closed, worshiping. You all thought I was singing and worshiping God. What was actually going on in my head was this, kill me now. Kill me. I want to die. I do not want to get up there and preach. I do not want to talk. And that's just what was going on in my, in my heart because it was new and I was scared. Now, the good news is, is when, I, when I stepped up here, the Holy Spirit met me right where I was at and did what he needed to do. But when I went back and I left, I went back to Dallas. I found out my job was gone. They said, you're fired. And I said, you can't fire me. I'm, I'm like, I'm a child of God, you know. <laughs> you know I, I did everything that I thought was right. And they said, well, you thought you did it right, but you didn't do it right, so you lost your job. And I was so upset and I was so heartbroken over that. But I remember through all of it, though I was upset, I, I, I didn't let it become something that, where anger ruled me. And my response to people was very important. And I remember handling it pretty well. I didn't blame my boss necessarily. I, I, I could have blamed my boss. I could have blamed my coworker who I thought covered my shifts. I could have blamed people, but I didn't. I just went ahead and decided it's not going to change anything anyway, so why not just own it and let's see what the next step is. And it was interesting to me uh, that one month, maybe two months later, um, one of the assistant general managers left to go start a new hotel. And he said, I want you to come with me. And I said, perfect, you know, great. It's an answer to prayer. But that wasn't the, the part that meant a lot to me. I mean, that was great. Don't get me wrong, because uh, I needed a job. But what meant the most to me was, he said, I know you. He said, I watched how you handle people. And he goes, and I, I like how you handle people. And he said, but what I appreciated the most and what I enjoyed the most was when you got fired, and even though you felt wrongfully accused, you didn't blame others. You didn't take uh, the road of, uh, you know, talking behind people's back. You just owned it. He said, and that speaks integrity to me. I want you to work for me. I didn't even see that and know that that's what was going on. You see, that's something you have to develop on the inside. And when you do that, it starts to leak out in everything that you do. People recognize integrous people, people who tell the truth, people who keep their words. And James says... Church, if you're going to succeed now, as I'm concluding this letter, everything I've told you that you need to do, you do need to do, but you need to do it with an integrous heart. You have to have at the core a heart that says, I'm going to do what it is I said I would do. Don't come up with lies and don't make stuff up. Don't make excuses. Be integrous. But yet in our world today, a lot of times people feel this need to lie. Why? Let me give you three reasons. You can write these down real quick. One of the reasons is self-protection. That's why we lie. People lie for self-protection. They get afraid of what people are going to think, feel, say, or do, and they want to protect their integrity. I want to protect you know, my image. So we lie, and we think it's okay. We justify the reason why we lie for self-protection. The other reason is self-centeredness. Write that down. We will lie because of a self-centeredness. We want to, to get what we want, and, and we want what we got. Now, I've said it before, sometimes you get what you want, but you don't want what you got once you get it. See, self-centered people will lie because they want everything to be about them, and they want that focus to be upon them, the attention, the promotions, the raises, and, and they'll get so centered on self, looking at themselves, that they will lie in order to continually promote themselves. Uh, and the third reason is, is self-importance. That's why we lie. People will lie because they want to feel good about them even if they have to make something up about them. They will lie. They will take a shortcut. They will lie to save face. They will lie to cover a mistake or to be liked or to appear important or to be, uh, appear more successful than they really are. That all has to do with self-importance. And here's the, here's the cool thing. In each and every one of these three situations, I'm not pointing out something you didn't know already. You, you know this exists, but here's the good part, is, is when you start to see this, and this is, this is going to, I don't like this part. When I started seeing this stuff in me, 
I had a choice, fight or flight. <laughs> uh, I could run from it and say, no, that's not me, that's not me, that's you. You know, I can start blaming everyone else. Or I could fight for what was right and say, Lord, are you sure? Are you serious? You see, if you come and tell me that I'm, I'm a liar because I'm self-centered and I'm self-important and I'm self, 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 you're going to make me mad and I'm not going to like you. But if the Holy Spirit shows up and reveals to me areas where I'm self-important or I'm self-centered, he has a way of doing it where I can go, really? And if you'll take a look and you'll start seeing areas that the Holy Spirit shows to you, you can now do something about that to build the integrity of your heart for his kingdom. So these are, these are reasons why we will lie. We will get more concerned about what we think and what we feel and what we want to cover and what we want to hide. But promises are, can be different. You know, have you ever made a promise to somebody or, or somebody's made a promise to you and we want to hold them to that promise. If somebody's promised you something, you want to hold them to it, right? You promised. You said you would. But yet some, sometimes people will break promises. James is talking to the church about an integrous person lets their yes be yes and their no be no. You know, say what you mean, mean what you say, but, but you need to be able to follow through with it. But sometimes people break promises. Sometimes they do it for, and I just gave three reasons. One that came to my mind was, one is because they get over-enthusiastic. They get over-enthusiastic. In other words, they bite off more than they can chew. And they can't fulfill what it is they said they would promise that they could fulfill. You know, that, that's for some people. Some people get over-enthusiastic. Sometimes people have a hard time just getting too enthusiastic. Um, but one of the reasons people break those promises is over-enthusiasm. Uh, they try to take on too much. Another reason is, is they get overextended. extended get overextended. We break a promise. We get overextended, and we can't uh, continue on. Do we have those on the PowerPoints there? Uh, you commit. You bite off more than you can chew. You, you can't do as much, and you start committing too much time. You, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, the boss asks you if you can stay a little bit later to which you want to make them happy so you can look important and you start overextending yourself and then somebody else asks more time of you and then your family and before you know it, you're burning the candle at both ends. And sometimes what we do is we end up breaking promises to other people simply because we're overextended. And the third reason is, is we overestimate. One of the reasons we break promises is we overestimate. <clears throat> This reason covers a lot of territory. We, we, we make promises based on unrealistic expectations or abilities. And so we have to be careful. Otherwise, we will live a life that, that starts to make excuses and reasons and we will end up looking like liars and promise breakers. But James says the thing you need to focus on is integrity. You need to focus on integrity. The purpose of an oath was to call upon someone or something greater than yourself as a witness to the promise that you were making. You ever say this? Oh, you know, God is my witness. I'll never do that again. God is my witness. I'll never say that again. That's an oath that you're making. You're saying, I believe so much in this promise that I'm calling you, God, to be witness to this promise I'm about to make. So be careful with what you say because the promises you make carry much weight. By calling on the name of God in an oath, what you're saying is that God was a witness to the promise that you just made. So be very careful about agreements that you make. The Bible says this. Let me read to you a couple of scriptures. They're not in your outlines, but in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, uh, Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Don't break your oath, but keep the oaths that you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Notice these words from Jesus. They're almost identical to what we just read in James. Did you notice that? Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. But notice Jesus concludes this statement by saying, Anything beyond that, the yes and the no, comes from the evil one. Comes from the evil one. In John chapter 8, um, Jesus says that lying is Satan's native tongue. It, that, that's the way he rolls. And he's going to do everything he can to get us to a place where we get deceived and not a place that has an integrous heart. John's main concern and, uh, with this group of people is the main concern that he has for us today, that in all that we do, we have a heart of integrity. So the question is simply this, 
How do we increase that integrity? How do we raise that level so that we can know that we can walk and we can grow in our, in our love for Christ and our love for others? I'm just going to give you four things, four words that we can write down that James concludes with in telling the people. He said, you want to increase your integrity? Do this. Number one, consider. Consider. In other words, think. Ponder. What you're about to do, the promise you're about to make, the commitment you're about to to get involved in, make sure that you have considered it so it's not something that you get involved in that you wished you wouldn't have gotten involved in after you've already committed. If you want to increase your integrity, don't make promises that you can't keep. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It's in your outlines. It's up here on 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 the screen. Let's read this one together. You ready? Go. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. I like, this is one of my favorite verses. Uh, I think it's the ESV translation that words it this way. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it affects everything that you do. I love that. Uh, I've used that since, since the days back in youth group. I used to tell teenagers, if you're going to get a tattoo, put this one on. Above all else, guard your heart. For it affects everything that you do. Everything? Everything. Every decision you make, we're responsible to consider, he says. Increasing the integrity in our heart or of our hearts means that we have to consider everything. We need to carefully, prayerfully consider before we make commitments. Is this what God wants for us? How many of you have ever committed to something only to say, I wish I would have prayed about that? I wish I could take that back. I wish I could redo that. I wish I could have a mulligan. I wish I could have a do-over. I never knew what a mulligan was uh, until I played with a friend of mine. His name's Nate, and he took me out to a golf course. Uh, don't, unless you want to get hurt, don't take me on a golf course, okay? Uh, you better have good insurance, or they better have good insurance. Uh, my divots of grass flew further than the ball ever did. Uh, my golf club went further than the ball ever did, and uh, I actually hit a... Uh, what did I put it in a lake twice and hit a house once? Hey, you're not that good, are you? I'd like to see you do that. And I remember when I was playing with him, I'd get mad. He's a stupid boy. He goes, I'll take a mulligan. What's a mulligan? It's a do-over. He said, I get to do this all over again? Are you sure you want me to do this all over again? You know, sometimes you're going to make, uh, you're going to consider and make a, make a decision. And you're going to know, Lord, I need your wisdom. Sometimes you're going to make mistakes. But guess what? God will say, that's okay. You can, you can, have a do-over. But consider first. If we're going to increase our integrity, consider. Think about it. Watch over your heart. Above all else, guard your heart for it affects everything you do. Number two, write this down. Commit. Once, if you're going to increase the integrity of your heart, your walk with Christ, after you've considered it, make a commitment. But know what it is that you're committing to. You're not just committing to want to make a commitment. You're committing, actually committing. When you made a commitment to ask Jesus into your heart, He didn't sit around and say, well, let me think about it. He didn't decide what parts he was going to commit to. He committed everything he had, and he's asking us to do the same. When you commit in a job, they want you to commit to that job, to their time. As an employer, you would want to commit to your employees and vice versa. So it is in relationships. Once you consider, you commit. And to commit to somebody means that you are coming to a place where you're going to keep your promises. Husbands and wives. You understand this because when you sat there and you said the vows in your wedding day, when, they, when you wanted them to commit, you meant fully, right? Or did you mean 75%? 50% of the time. 25%. No, you wanted 100% commitment. That's exactly what God's asking from us. If you're going to develop in your integrity, consider and then make that commitment. David Jeremiah. Have you heard of David Jeremiah? I believe he's on WDLM. He's on a couple other radio stations. I was listening uh, to, or I read a statement that he wrote about integrity, and he worded it this way. Integrity is keeping my commitments, even if the circumstances when I made the commitments have changed. Integrity is keeping my commitment, even if circumstances change from when I made that commitment. Well, I made a commitment to love him. I made a commitment to love her, but that was then. This is now. Things have changed. It's still a commitment your commitment. I committed to this job that this is what I was going to do, but, but they, they're pushing me here and pushing me there. They, things may have changed, but you made a commitment. When you committed to love the Lord, 
my life has changed. Things are more difficult. I don't know if I can do this. No, things may have changed, but you made a commitment. He's not left you. Don't leave him. Make that commitment. Number three, write down the word confess. Confess. You know, when you consider, then you make a commitment. I'm going to guarantee you this. You will make mistakes. You will fall down. You will fail. Get back up. Get back up. When I was teaching, I, I use this illustration all the time, but it's the best picture I have in my head. When my kids were learning to ride a bike, I was scared. I was nervous. You know, you got your hand behind the seat. You know what I'm talking about? And then there comes that time where you got to let go. But I don't really want to let go. But I know I need to let go. You know what I'm talking about? You kind of teeter-totter, and then you let go. And bam, they crash. What do you do? Why don't walk over and pick up their bike, throw it in the dumpster and say, loser, you're never going to ride this bike. You don't do that. What do you do? You, you, you run to them and you pick them up and you say, are you okay? Are you all right? Okay, let's get the bike back up. Here, get back on the bike. No, daddy, I don't want to get on the bike. No, 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 no. And you encourage them to get back on the bike, don't you? Why do you do that? Because they are now afraid of the bike. So you get them back on that bike and you get them riding it as quick as possible because you know that they can do this. You know that they can, they can make this happen. There's going to be times where you will fall down and you will fail. You'll mess up. You'll make mistakes. God's going to come along and he's going to pick you right back up. And he's going to say, it's all right. You've made a mistake. Repent. Get back on the bike. Get back on the bike. You know, keeping our word and keeping on increasing that integrity is important. The commitments that we make. I remember when my, they, they were younger. My kids were younger, but um, they wanted ice cream one night. They want ice cream many nights, actually. And, uh, um, how many of you are ice cream eaters in weather like this? Yeah, that doesn't bother you? I'm like freezing on the outside. Why would I want to freeze on the inside? Um, but I remember when they were little kids. Uh, daddy, 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 you know, all that stuff. I want to go to the ice cream. Can we get some ice cream? Can we? And they wear you out. And uh, yes, we can go get some ice cream. I'll get, we'll, go that, we'll go later. Oh, do you promise, Dad? And you say, yes, I promise. We'll go get ice cream later. But then all of a sudden your day gets away from you. You know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden... Life got busy, and there's bigger things I got to deal with than your blizzard, your ice cream cone, your whatever, you know. And, and so I'm justifying why life is, you know, I love you, but it's ice cream. And I remember the Lord got a hold of my heart one, uh, one night when they were doing this. And they said, Daddy, Daddy, can we get ice cream? No, honey, well, I don't think we're going to be able to make it. I said, you know, this happened and this happened, and we got to do this, we got to do that. They don't care. All they heard was wah, 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 no ice cream. And I remember they said, they looked at me and they said those infamous words, but you promised. <laughs> they ever do that to you? Maybe you did that to your parents? But you promised, they said. And I remember in a moment, I thought, whatever, you know, what's the big deal? It's, it, it's just ice cream. And I remember the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit, it had to be the Lord. He said, it's not just about ice cream. It's about your word. And I thought, oh, don't you get involved in this. It's freezing out there, and I don't want to go outside, and i got to do this, and i got to do this, and i got to do this. And now, now, now you want to show up and talk. It seems like when I cry out, God, help me, you're not there. But when my kid wants a blizzard, now you're showing up <laughs> teaching me biblical principles. You know what I'm talking about? And he said, Jimmy goes, you made a promise, and it's about keeping your word. You don't have to go get them the ice cream cone, but don't be surprised when they don't believe you when you say that you'll come through on other things. And I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> and I wrestled with that. And we got in the car and we went and got some ice cream. You know why? Because I told them I would take them. I gave them my word and I wanted my, my word to be a word of integrity. And so we went and we got the ice cream. See, your words are very important. A heart of integrity. There's going to be times when you'll be challenged in the little things as well as some, some things that are bigger. The question at the end of the day is, are you cultivating that heart of integrity? You know, one of the greatest things that I've enjoyed in life is being a dad. I, I just, it's just fun. I, I love it. If I could get paid for it, this would be my full-time job, being a dad. I've enjoyed it so much. It's had its ups, it's had its downs, but I've loved it. And I'll tell you what I've learned. I've learned that I'm not a perfect dad. I make mistakes just like anyone else. And the question is not will you make mistakes. The question is, is when you make mistakes, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do in the midst of it? You know, I gave you that third point and I said confess. There's going to be times where you're going to make mistakes in your walk with Christ. You've got to do the same thing that you do when you're raising your kids. I messed up. 
and you make it right. I remember one time I took, I took off one of my kids' head. You ever respond to your kids in a harsh way, that maybe a little bit harsher than you meant to? And, um, and I remember uh, one day I, I, may, I may have responded a little harshly, and, and, and I just heard the Lord say, you need to go apologize. And I thought, I don't need to apologize. They're five. They're six. Again, you know, you just kind of put that off. And he said, no. He said, it's about your words. He says, if I can't trust you to obey me when I speak to you in these matters, how can I trust you in bigger ones? How can I trust that you're going to have an integrous heart that's willing to do what it is I'm telling you to do? You messed up. I'm just asking you to man up and confess. Just go and apologize. See, there's going to be times where God wants to know, are you more concerned with your pride and are you more concerned with your image? Or are you more concerned with what it is that God's telling you what it is that you need to do? So we need to consider. We need to commit. We need to confess. And the last one is simply this. Write down the word cease. We need to surrender. I just had to come up with a C word. So I'm like, consider, you know, cease. We'll go with that because James says this. If you want to increase the integrity in your heart, you have to be ready to surrender to God. Surrender to God. Some people here today are better at this than others. Some people can get stubborn and not want to surrender, but want to try to figure it out on their own. And he says, until you come to this place, you will not be able to have the integrity that God has designed or intended because he wants us to surrender to him. If a policeman were to stick a gun in your face right now, what would you do? We have no problem. Hands go up. I remember, uh, I think the alarm went off and my dad rounded a corner and a policeman was coming across, <laughs> had his gun out. When my dad rounded the corner, gun came out. He did not have to think, pray, fast, Boom! Hands went up. <laughs> Why is it that we don't have a problem surrendering in that moment, but when God says he wants us to surrender, we say, well, let me think about it. You know, they, they do some uh, training in town, and I got to play the bad guy. That was pretty fun. I loved it. They said, Pastor, will you be the bad guy? And I'm like, for real? They're like, yeah. I said, can I, like, yell at you and call you names? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, excellent. And so I was looking forward to this. And... Uh, they gave me a whole story and scenario, and I, I kind of, I had fun with it. Let's just leave it at that. And uh, gave them a hard time, and they were doing their training. And I remember it came a point where I was told, uh, in your scenario, you surrender, but don't do it right away. I said, all right, no problem. And um, SWAT team, heat team, whatever they call them, I think it's heat team here in Clinton, they're all dressed in black. And I know this is a scenario, so I'm having fun with this, and I'm like, okay, I'm coming out. They said, well, come on out, and uh, I have my hands up, <clears throat> and I come out to this front porch, and here's five to six guys dressed in black, and all you can see is their eyeballs, shields, automatic weapons. There was something very humbling. <laughs> Even though I knew this was totally, like, not for reals, it still made me want to wet my pants just a little bit, just a little bit, because I walked out there, and, you know, these guys shuffling together, they're coming at you, and you're like, holy cow. And I remember thinking, I wonder what they'll do if I put my hands down. I thought, well, we'll just give it a shot. My hands, I put them down. And I got to about right here before I had everybody in the world screaming, at me, get your hands out of here. Boom, hands went way up here. <laughs> and before I know it, the last thing I remember was a, an arm dressed in black. Then I saw the green grass. <laughs> and uh, then I had a knee in my back. And then I had somebody whispering, saying, you doing okay, chaplain? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm doing all right. I had no problem surrendering in a moment when there was somebody physically in front of me that would point you know, a weapon. Why is it that we have a hard time surrendering when God just simply shows up and says, I want to give you more. I want to increase your integrity. I want, I want to develop inside of you, but you need to surrender this part of your heart to me. And we go, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. To our own error, it destroys us when we shut God out and try because of pride's sake to make it on our own at the, at the chance of uh, living a lie of breaking promises or lying. He says, I just want to bless you with more. But we're going to have to come to a place that we surrender. Simply put, and I'm getting ready to close, believe it or not, it is nine minutes till. Simply put, integrity is doing what you said that you would do. Even if it means it's going to cost you. Because in the long run, God is going to be the one that will reward you. So, as you roll into this season, 
my challenge for us as we come to the end of this series. We've talked about a lot of things, from temptations to trials to sin to attitudes to motives of the heart. The challenge is at the end of it all, everything that we've talked about, to have a heart of integrity. It is the thing that will lead us and guide us in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray with me, Father. I pray that as we come to a conclusion, Lord, that it would be a new beginning in what you want to do. Lord, I pray that in all that we face, all the struggles that we go through, Lord, that we would be reminded that greater is he that's within us than anything else in this world. Man, I pray today, as we leave here today, we would walk in the freedom and in the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, inside of us, challenge us in those areas where maybe we know that we're lacking in integrity. And I pray that you would give us a heart that so desires more of you. So, Father God, we thank you for this. We ask this in your name. Amen.